Let us start the day. So welcome to, uh, to the witnesses who are here today with us um, on H273. Our first witness who was scheduled has a, um, uh, is delayed and, and will join us in a little while. And so Brian Lowe, if you are here, um, and actually for all witnesses, we're going to introduce ourselves to thank you, to thank, you know, thank you for coming. The difference between now and Zoom time is that you can't see our names anymore, um, except for those of us who are remote. So um, we'll start here with the folks who are on, on Zoom, and then we'll come back to the people who are here live. So Representative Howard, you'll start us off. Yeah. Good morning. I am Mary Howard. I represent Rutland Southwest um, District 5-3. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Representative Chip Troiano. I'm broadcasting this morning from the flanks of Standard Mountain in the beautiful Northeast Kingdom and I represent a town that I represent. Thank you. And Representative Troiano, you have a legacy hand. Representative Matt Byron, uh, Virgins, I represent Northwest Addison County. Representative Chip Bloomley, I represent the South End of Burlington. John Kowacki, South Burlington. Morning, I'm Joe Parsons, I represent uh, Grant, Topsom, and Newberry. Morning, John Blasek, and I represent Milton. Good morning, I'm Tommy Waltz from Berry City. Good morning, I'm Barbara Murphy, I serve Fairfax in the District of Franklin too. And I am Representative Tom Stevens. I live in Waterbury, representing Waterbury, Huntington, Bolton, and Gills Gore. Um, so welcome here on H273, which is an act relating to promoting racial and social equity and land access and property ownership. Uh, this is a bill that we've been taking some testimony on and building up. And one of the things that stood out in this, um, in some of the, re the reintroduction of the bill earlier this year is that the work that the seating power group or the main stakeholders on this did was um, they told us that they had modeled this bill and this concept on the working lands um, bills that have been passed over the last several years. And so I think it's useful for us to go to that source and really get an understanding of the process that led up to it, whatever you can testify about the process that, that happened, which was which was very grassroots and it was organized, not just for BCRD, but BCRD, the Vermont Council of Development was a major player in that. Um, and so we just wanted to have you testify to the, your specialties and like how, how does the working lands initiatives work? How did it get there? How does it work? And how does it really apply to what we're talking about in um, in this bill, and I think that's the charge for today. So I'll start with Brian Lowe, who is the new executive director from the Vermont Council on Rural Development. Um, welcome to General Housing and Military Affairs. Hey, thank you very much, Chair Stevens, um, Ranking Member Murphy, and representatives of the House Committee on uh, General Housing and Military Affairs. It's it's really an opportunity to uh, speak with you today. So thank you. Um, I am the new executive director at the Vermont Council on Rural Development. Um, VCRD is an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit dedicated to the support of locally defined progress in Vermont's communities. Um, and I've been asked to speak to the history of the working lands enterprise and also to be brief. And so I will try and do both those things for you. Um, I'm hoping to focus my comments on three points, um, how the working lands enterprise board came into being, um, some of the important elements of that process and the current state of affairs um, from VCRD's perspective. Um, it's important to note at the outset, that this really was a grassroots effort that preceded my time at, at VCRD. And so the credit belongs to many across the state. Um, farmers, foresters, loggers, other leaders of the working lands enterprises deserve great credit, um, as does Paul Costello, members of the state administrations, including I see Lynn Ellen and, and Abby Willard here today, um, and critically, many members of the legislature um, who worked to turn many different voices into a very productive and meaningful program. Um, many, many different legislators played a role, um, but I know Representative Partridge, Chairwoman of the Ag and Forest Committee, um, former Representative Will Stevens, and many others also played major roles. Um, on the first point, how the Working Lands Enterprise Board came into being, it started with a statewide effort led by BCRD in what was called the Council on the Future of Vermont. This was a two-year effort from 2007 to 2009 
that engaged hundreds of Vermonters in a dialogue about the state's past and present. Um, a major finding of that report was that more than 97% of Vermonters um, engaged saw great value in working landscape of the state, not just for its importance to Vermont's economy or its draw for tourism, but because the landscape represented much of what Vermonters loved about this state and our communities. That love for and respect of the working lands was matched by some significant threats to those farm and forest enterprises that made um, getting a living off the land very difficult and still does. And so an extensive effort was led by the council um, on Vermont's future that led to the creation of what was called the Working Lands Partnership in 2010, uh, focused on that question of what could be done to make working lands enterprises more sustainable. That partnership, which was hundreds strong, had the leadership of the council um, on Vermont's future and produced an action plan that was a set of thoughtful strategies for investing in Vermont's farm and forest future. That plan, which was released in 2011, um, became the basis of a bill, H-496, um, that year, which ultimately passed both House and Senate as Act 142, an act related to preserving Vermont's working landscape. And out of that act came the Working, Lander working Lands Enterprise Fund and the board that ultimately oversees it. The second point um, beyond that quick history is to emphasize the importance of several elements of that timeline. And the first is time itself. The Council for Vermont's Future was convened in 2007. Act 142 was passed in 2012. Um, a significant amount of time passed, a significant amount of public feedback was taken, uh, and the bill that ultimately passed the House and Senate was the result of significant input from farm and forest enterprises. Legislators transformed those voices and plans into concrete legislative action and ultimately a productive and meaningful program that in the years since it's been instituted has produced more than 500 jobs and had a an, uh, return on investment of excess of $5 for every dollar invested through 2020, um, which are the most recent ROI numbers available. The second important element to emphasize is just the people. This truly was a program that resulted from extensive public input over an extended period of time and deliberate and thoughtful action based on that input. And the third element to highlight today is just the program's design. It is intended to serve Vermonters across the state, and it does that to reach all 14 counties, providing valuable resources to support practical projects in all areas of the state. The third and final point I would make is just to share briefly where things stand about working lands. First, I'd like to thank legislators who've already appropriated an additional 2.1 million for the working lands this current fiscal year as part of the BAA process. That quick action has put a total of about $7.5 million into the working lands program this year. That is a great achievement. It will be well used, um, especially since the number of viable applications is likely to continue to exceed that $7.5 million allocation. Second, I'd like to thank the governor and his team for their budget proposal this year, which does increase the base funding of working lands to about a million dollars. And third, given that there's been a significant unmet need in the allocations of $7.5 million this year and $3.5 million in the fiscal year of 21, the state's fiscal year that preceded that, we suspect that the $1 million allocation for FY23 will probably leave significant unmet need. Um, as part of the Working Lands Coalition, VCRD continues to advocate for trans transformational investment in the Working Lands Enterprise Fund um, and to the tune of $15 million in one-time funding uh, this year to be spent over three years. As you weigh H-273 and the need to increase access to land and home ownership, that no need for further investment in farm and forest enterprises and that increased capital access for Working Lands Enterprises um, needs to be broadly on your mind as well. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. <laughs> um, thank you, Brian. And, and for any of your other witnesses, if you haven't already, if you could submit any of your written testimony to us, um, that we can just submit it to Ron Wild, and then we'll be able to post it. Because um, Brian, I want to—I don't want to focus too too much on the on the dollars right now, but I think understanding what kind of allocations have been made over time um, will be important for our work here as well. Um, thank you. Any other questions for Brian at this time? All right, next up I have Abby Willard, who is the Director of the Agricultural Development Division for the Agency <laughs> of Agriculture, Food and Markets. Welcome, Abby. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Stevens. Yeah, so I'm Abby Willard, Director of the Ag Development Division at the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets, for the record. Thanks for inviting us. This is not a committee that we have a longstanding relationship or history testifying before. So it's, it's nice to meet you all virtually and have the opportunity to talk about one of the uh, flagship programs within the Agency of Agriculture and administered at the Ag Development Division. 
um, for a variety of reasons. So I, I can offer some really overarching comments and then um, if it suits you, Chair Stevens, to turn it over to Linnell and Schmoller who manages our working lands program and I can speak to more of the specifics. So thank you, Brian, for sharing so much of the history and speaking to the role that VCRD and the coalition has historically and, and to this day continues to play in this really valuable partnership of having some advocacy for a program and then the logistics managed by the administration. So one of the aspects of the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative that I think is really unique and worthy of acknowledging and, and emulating in other programs is its consistency in process, its access, access to reliable annual funding and the longevity that the program has in demonstrating its impacts. And Lynn Ellen and probably we will be able to talk about the impacts around job creation, increase in gross sales, as well as the acres that have remained in working lands production as a result of the working lands enterprise investments. Another really important and critical aspect of this program worthy of considering in, um, in, in this circumstance around S-273 would be the value of partnerships. So having this administered by the Agency of Agriculture and staffed by the Agency of Agriculture, but that it being a true partnership between our agency, the Agency of Commerce and Community Development and the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation really speaks to the administration's commitment to engaging in working lands, protection, innovation, and investment. So there's a lot of power in that triumvirate, as well as having uh, board members that represent the expertise and industry perspective across so many sectors, which again, Lynn Ellen can probably share more specifics about as she manages most of those board appointments and in those relationships. We really couldn't do the program though without the sufficient and committed staff that are focused on the integrity of the program, the fairness of the review process, and all the grantee and applicant stewardship that happens to sort of let grantees and those that apply for funds um, understand the strength of their projects, the opportunities that exist for them to re um, access additional resources as needed and, and engage in the reporting to demonstrate the impact of their investments across the state. As Brian alluded to, the program has had annual oversubscription and has had a, an oscillating annual allocation. So the dollars allocated to the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative have fluctuated over time. Um, and each year uh, we can speak to the opportunity that the industry has risen to and created demand that exceeds the al allocation every year, which I think speaks to the value of having consistent annual funding every year for a program that the industries can rely upon. So they always know that there's an opportunity to apply for working lands funds. They don't have to wonder if the program is gonna be in existence are gonna be funded in the subsequent year. So something that um, I think having that long-term investment in the program has been valuable. And then I lastly would just speak to the value of the partnerships of all the organizations and the, the camaraderie that exists in Vermont by having partners like NOFA and so many others that are supportive of the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative and the work that happens. Um, through this board and through the funding commitments that are made and the, the engagement with the staff and other board members. So I think we can speak in greater detail, but it also looks like that there's a question. Representative Trail. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair Stevens, and uh, thank you, Amy, for your, uh, for your information. Uh, the question, and maybe this would be deferred to someone else, but the question I have in mind is, so we're trying to um, increase um, uh, possession of farmland uh, as one of the uh, aspects of this bill. And um, so I've noticed around here that there are a lot more hops being grown. So uh, suppose uh, someone is to purchase 10 acres um, and with a plan to grow hops, how much 
can he rely on the Agency of Agriculture and or the Working Lands uh, Initiative uh, to uh, assist in him? Uh, hops are pretty um, difficult to grow in some respects. They take a lot of work and, and trellising and whatnot. Uh, how much can they rely on for um, you know, information and even subsidies uh, to get into a venture such as this? Would you have an answer to that or someone? Yeah, Representative Triano, that's a great question. I, I think I can offer a little perspective, and then, um, and then, and then maybe it may be a good time to to transition if, if the committee is willing to to Linnell and Schmoller to talk about the program in more detail. Um, but let's take hop production as an example. So it is a, an industry where we we have seen interest and demand. We've certainly seen applications come into the competitive grants that are awarded through the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative, and we have awarded um, HOP businesses grants to support a business venture. So that could be an opportunity for growth, for purchasing new equipment or expanding their infrastructure. It could be doing research and um, exploring different HOP varietals and or looking at new marketing opportunities of scaling production and selling to, to, new, to new customers. So those are the types of project ideas that the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative has generally uh, received in applications and been able to award in grants. I think the important part about most of the work of the Ag Development Division is that we offer competitive funding opportunities mostly which means there's an application period, you apply, you're one of many competitive applications and those applications are reviewed, scored, and then again, being that the programs are most always oversubscribed, only a portion of those applications are awarded grants. So there's always that, um, that potential of, of your project not being funded in this round, and you may have to wait a year or you may have to modify your application to be more competitive. Um, we may recommend that you apply for another source of funding that's a better fit for your project. Um, and so we have an, some businesses that have applied multiple years before they've actually been awarded funds through one. Uh, we lost you, Abby. We lost your your voice. Your audio is gone. Yep. The cut out. Yep. Thank you. Gone is it now. better now? So sorry. Thanks for the yep. the heads up, Grace. My internet has this terrible habit of just losing audio, but it doesn't give me any warning. So thanks for telling me. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so this is where the Working Lands Program can address some of the industry needs, not all of them, and we're very reliant upon the variety of funding sources to, to fill the gap. Um, but hopefully that gives you a sense of what may be available for a particular producer or sector in agriculture. So would there be assistance in, in uh, the application process, for instance? Some folks may need that, and uh, that could be, I mean, my interest is that these ventures succeed. Uh, and uh, I think it's very important um, uh, as part of this uh, this bill uh, that becomes law that these ventures succeed. And oftentimes um, application process is complicated and a little bit cumbersome for folks that are not used to it. Um, and um, there are situations in which application uh, assistance and, and applications uh, are available uh, from uh, resources. Yeah, it's a great question. I, I wonder if this would be an opportunity to transition to Lynn Ellen Schmoller. I'd love for Lynn Ellen. She does an amazing amount of applicant assistance, and, and I'd love for her to be able to speak to that directly of, of the process that she utilizes and the level of response and engagement that she offers, if, if that would be acceptable. That would be great. Thank you. Sure. And Representative Clark, do you have a question? <laughs> Well, thank you, uh, Abby and Brian. Uh, and I, I'm on the website for the Working Lands Enterprise right now to learn about all the grants. Thanks. I'm sorry. I, I, I wonder if the bill we're talking about, H273, isn't quite this, but could it could it could something like that actually be incorporated into the Working Lands Enterprise and have it targeted towards the BIPOC community? 
and have a really big grant to help with uh, down payments. Is, is that, or is that too much of a mission drip? <laughs> <laughs> Or a philosophical question at this point in time. I mean, just to put it out there as a yeah, 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 yeah. Well, let's just leave that on the table. I, I think Abby, I, I don't want to put you on the spot of like speaking about how we can expand it now, but I think that that's a valid. I think that's just a question as we learn about working lands, and that's why we're here, is because I want to hear how similar something that's existent and extant is to what we're talking about in this bill. Um, I, my last question for you, Abby, if, if that's okay, John, we'll just leave it hanging there, you know, just for sure. now. Absolutely. Um, I, I think my last question for Abby before we go to Lynn Allen is, you talked about the first time I've heard people refer to um, your budget receipts as oscillating, um, which is a great <laughs> word for, for not knowing exactly how much money you're gonna get every particular year. And right. that's what drives your competitive process, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? I mean, it's it's you can only give away the money that you receive. And um, but you do receive set set amounts of money, and then there's money added in when there's surplus. Is that is that the right understanding? Yeah, so that's it's a good clarifying question. So yeah, we've had <clears throat> um, a consistent base allocation for the working lands enterprise investment funding for, I'd have to look back at maybe the last four years, and then there's been additional one-time allocations added of varying amounts from, you know, another $500,000 to a million to this last year, there was 5 million in two and 3 million increments. Um, so the, the competitiveness of the granting program is by design, though, that there will you know, be an application process, there's a deadline, applications are reviewed and scored, and top scoring or best fit applications are those that are awarded. So the competitiveness is by nature and design um, with opportunity for the board to review and um, ask for additional questions. And, and um, again, Lynn Ellen can, can speak to the details of that process since she manages those, those intricacies. Um, but I think the, there's additional competitiveness as a result of, of the oscillating allocation. So, um, but, you know, and again, we can share some of these numbers if, you, if you're interested. Uh -huh. Every year that the allocation changes for the program, the demand responds. So on a year that we have you know, like this past year where we have 5.5 million to award, we received over 10 million in applications. In years that we've had, you know, two and a half million to award, we've received, you know, 5 million in applications. So it's pretty customary that the program has been able to fund, you know, somewhere between 20 and 30% of applications that have been submitted. And so wh while I think it would be great to have a larger conversation around could we add this land access and opportunity component into the working lands program, I think the biggest question for me becomes um, a, a relatively representative allocation for the program to accommodate that kind of an additional focus area. And we've had experience in, pre in recent years of the legislature carving out a particular ask within the working lands program. So this last year, it was around meat slaughter and processing capacity. Previously, it was around dairy innovation or secondary wood manufacturing. And that, that has worked well to have particular focus areas or we call buckets, funding buckets, for the program to focus on. And, and Lynn Ellen and her team can, and the partners can do additional recruitment and, and promotion to those audiences. Um, but I just think we'd have to have, we'd have to really think about the funding to uh, requisite to the, to the added focus area. Thank if that makes you. sense. Yeah. Yep, thank you. Lynn Ellen, welcome. Good morning. Thank you, Chair and Representatives, for having us visit with you this morning. It's an honor to be here and talk about a great program. Um, 
I have a couple points that I want to go over, but I first want to say that it's really impossible to review the ontology of this program without referencing Brian Lowe's notes and the work of the Council on the Future of Vermont and its 2009 report, Imagining Vermont Values and Vision for the Future. That report was really the home of a data point that has perennially proven to be really vital in the mandate for this program. So the Working Lands Program and Governing Board were created in accordance, accordance with Act 142 of 2012 for stimulating economic development in the ag, for cultural and forestry sectors by systematically advancing entrepreneurship, business development, and job creation. We know to date from mining data uh, based on surveys from different sectors, we funded over 240 projects They've impacted all the counties across the state. We've deployed over $7 million in funds and we've leveraged about $11 million in matching funds. We also know that um, at least from 2012 to 2018, 524 jobs have been created. We've impacted over 19,000 acres in agricultural production. We've employed over a thousand people and we know that we've generated sales of over $36 million. So some really great impacts. I do want to start by saying that it could be the case that committees are really the strongest leverage point for the Working Lands Inter Board, Enterprise Board in its really um, robust quest for clear and good strategy, effective operations, and system impact. And so by creating a toolkit for, an, for activating and optimizing the Working Lands Enterprise Board committees, that's helped us to feature things like a really good review program, um, charters, work plans for the committees, and then of course an annual schedule that can sync with the board cal calendar. Um, board members are um, really busy. And so, you know, getting them to consider how the committee work and committee leadership really simultaneously enhances their satisfaction as board members. And it really builds on the program standing as an impactful and operationally excellent state program. So secondly, I'll go through just the process of applying for and granting funds through the program and hopefully answer some of the questions that emerged about assistance to applicants. I begin with outreach across the state and that includes public sector, private sector, forest and woods sector, food and farm sectors, our service providers that provide technical and business assistance around the state, networks, programs, practitioners, business enterprises, trade associations. After that outreach is conducted, we also have webinar sessions, including information for applicants like key dates, program information, eligibility, what are the types of grants that are open, we encourage them to develop their application materials from assistance from me, but also from assistance from service providers around the state. That can include our partners, the Farm and Forest Viability Program through Vermont Housing Conservation Board. It could include viability partners at Northeast Organic Farming Association, Center for Agricultural Economy, or Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund. This year alone, based on the amount of applications that we got in, I conducted um, close to 50 distinct one-to-one -one meetings after these webinars, because once we conduct the webinar and post it on the website, applicants then reach out to me with further questions. So that's a really important touchstone. Um, there's a lot of really important outreach that needs to go to applicants because you get a wide variety of different types of businesses in need. Abby talked about need and certainly we're enjoying unprecedented appropriation of funds of 5.3 million. We did review over hundred applications with project requests to date totaling over $10 million. We're still going through applications for the larger projects, but just to give you an understanding of what we've funded so far as of January, over $600,000 to service provider organizations, which will provide technical and business assistance to ag and forest businesses for topics like marketing and branding, ability to brand, developing and selling products. We funded over $500,000 to standard business infrastructure projects. These are smaller. They ranged from 10,000 to 25,000. 
and focused on marketing plans for business, sales strategy development, enhancing production or manufacturing efficiencies. We funded over 600,000 to meet processing and solder enterprises for production improvements. We know that there have been known existing bottlenecks in infrastructure, HACCP food safety plans and implementation. So these funds will really help these businesses with procurement and pricing strategy, um, focusing on cured meat operation, et cetera. And then finally, uh, we have funded close to $200,000 to producer associations. We've seen that producer associations continue to need help with leadership and organizational development, which it could include just looking at their business structure, onboarding or transitions for new executive directors and post-succession, and then governance for board training and capacity. We find a lot of these producer associations tend to be run by busy private sector individuals. And so per, by providing them some help with that governance, um, it really helps them to move forward. If you don't mind, I'd like to just talk a little bit about that equity inclusion question. I think um, it could be the case that equity inclusion is maybe the most significant current opportunity for addressing a, a range of goals and challenges recognized by the state as a whole, as well as the working man's economy. The board has had some nascent conversations. Um, this could be a front burner question for them in the near term. There have been some ongoing strategic concerns and operational imperatives um, that compete <laughs> for the limited bandwidth of the board and for staff. But I do think that equity inclusion efforts that are systematic within organizations tend to be more substantive and effective when they're woven into the fabric of an organization's structures and activities, as opposed to sort of addressed as a side issue. And so um, the Service Writer Strategy Committee, which helps with some of the request for applications, did weave into the scoring criteria to take a look at equity and inclusion dialogue within partner stakeholders. Um, we're trying to make sure that when service providers apply that the work that's happening in their organization has moved past sort of the peripheral value shifts to the center of the organization's strategic development. And so um, I would say one of the first service providers that showed up after that shift in the scoring criteria for the RFP was the Vital Communities Project that was funded in FY21. And they have Vermont Relief Collective as a named partner. Um, they're creating a BIPOC land access every town handbook. So that's just an example of some of the nascent um, work the board is doing. And then I think the other item would be an opportunity potentially that they've discussed um, in terms of the nominating committee. And Abby, I don't know if you wanted to answer that question additionally that was asked about equity inclusion. I'm, I'm not sure that I have anything else to add. I, I was thinking about, um, and I was trying to look it up really quickly, but I, I think it might be interesting for this committee to understand, and, and Linnell, and you may, you may know, or this may be something we can bring back to the committee, but Working Lands has not historically been awarding grants that uh, for land, land purchase and acquisition. And so that has been, a, I think, just a policy procedure of the board to not make investments in that category. So I just want to touch on that a little bit. And again, we can get you back more information if, if Linnell and I are not prepared to talk about that at the moment. But I mean, I, again, our conversations with the Abenaki community and, and with BIPOC populations, primarily with Abenaki communities, has been around the value of um, accessing land to be able to have land ownership and be able to engage greater food production and livestock kind of grazing. And I, I think these are, I mean, we all agree that these would be really important issues and particularly around indigenous lands um, and populations. So I, we could talk about that, but I, I also just wanna think from the standpoint of working lands, how, how land acquisition has or has not been a priority in statute or just in, in internal board policy. Yeah, Abby, you're correct. The board hasn't traditionally funded 
directly land projects. Um, the grants have ranged, you know, they're very, they vary in range, focus, and criteria, depending on the board's assessment of what the market needs are. Um, and I, I think that in years where the scale of appropriation has allowed, the board has ventured into larger grants as we've seen in the past um, two years while I'll skip over COVID. So FY20, FY22, um, the board's ventured into scaling up grants intended to impact open or even potentially create markets for Vermont, Vermont Working Lands products. I would imagine that there's some tentacles between land trusts as well. I mean, that, that people would be purchasing land or have the opportunity to purchase land through the land trust model, through the Vermont land trust model, you know, and then be able to, I mean, I think that's, they're not two different silos. They're all, there are tentacles connecting all of this together. Um, so I appreciate that it's not, that you are not a one-stop shop. Um, that's true. Full disclosure, I'm a trustee on the Vermont Land Trust, but I would encourage you to potentially have a conversation with the president, Nick Richardson. Yeah. Um, Representative Triano. Yes, just a quick question. Is there an anticipated channel in which um, a potential um, or a, 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 acquirement, a acquiring land and with an agricultural plan, uh, is there a channel for that person? Uh, for instance, acting uh, in behalf of this, uh, uh, in, in reaction to this legislation that will connect them with you for the assistance? Does that channel exist or is it in, in a plan to exist? Uh, thinking that I understand your question, um, there are prop there are probably better places to go than the working lands program if an individual is looking to purchase or access land so there's a variety of programs in vermont including landlink and others that are about sort of matchmaking either land that's looking for a land manager or a land manager that's looking for land and there's there's other organizations and partners and programs in the state that that's their that's their primary focus is trying to ensure that people can can access agricultural land. Well, actually, my question was, if the land is acquired, um, is there a is there how will this individual get information that this um, it, these services are available? That's the question. Oh, uh, OK, thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. So. Um, that is a separate question, and that's where we have um, many, and, and NOFA Vermont being one of those partners that engage in new and beginning farmer resources and programming. So really, in, in the Agency of Agriculture, we get contacted every week probably with an individual that's looking for, I wanna start growing hops, or I'm moving to Vermont and I've, I've purchased 150 acres and I wanna know what I should do. So we get those calls frequently and so we have sort of a an established kind of like new and beginning farmer um, process of sending them an email or doing a phone conversation and directing them to other resources so we might connect them to nofa for their new and beginning new and beginning farmer program or to ubm extension different resources that are really focused on having beginning conversations with businesses as they're trying to determine if they need a business plan, if they already have um, a market channel or a set of crops and livestock that they're interested in, in cultivating or growing or raising uh, to begin those conversations. But it's true, the Agency of Agriculture does not have specifically a new and beginning farmer program, but thankfully many of our partners in the state do, and we help connect them to those resources. Yes, that does answer my question. Thank you. Okay. All right, um, I want to move to Grace, is it Odell? It is, yep. And um, welcome Grace and Stephanie, welcome for, welcome um, to the committee again. And we'll, we're gonna hear from Grace and then we're gonna take a break, a short break and then we'll get to, to Stephanie. So you know, we just flip the, the calendar a little bit here. And I know that some folks from, um, I, I see that 
I, I see that um, Brian has to duck off. I think Abby, you have to duck off soon as well. So please feel free to duck off when you when you need to. Um, Grace, welcome to General Housing Military Affairs. Thank you, Chair Stevens, and thanks to the whole committee very much for having me. I don't get to testify on this committee um, often, and it's an honor to be here today and get to share our perspective on this bill as an agricultural organization. Um, my name is Grace O'Dell. I'm the Executive Director of the Northeast Organic Farming Association of Vermont, and just quick, quickly about who we are. We're a 50-year-old member-based organization with a mission to build an economically viable ecologically sound and socially just Vermont food and farming system. We have around 1200 members and we certify around 800 farms to the organic standard in the state. We work on a broad variety of issues that range from farm viability to climate resilience to food security and beyond. So it's quite an expansive um, body of work. And we work to really bring people together to, to plan, to plant for our shared future. So we're a member of the Working Lands Coalition and you've heard from a lot more expert colleagues here on the mechanics of that program and exactly how the history of it. I really appreciate seeing our colleagues here today to speak on this bill with us and share whatever we can uh, to how the Working Lands Coalition model might help inform our thinking on this bill. Uh, just from my perspective, as you've heard already, the program has had really an outsized economic impact for the state. Uh, and our co my colleagues are have spoken to already, so I won't rehash sort of how it serves the community. And I'd like to step back and share a big picture around our support for the need for the intention in this bill. As Abby just mentioned, you know, we see as NOFA an enormous need for land access funds. And I would encourage you, as Lynn Ellen said, to, to connect with Nick Richardson at Vermont Land Trust if you haven't already. We receive outreach all the time as NOFA Vermont to inquiries around sort of what, what funds are out there to help me access land. I'm a beginning farmer. I, I, I want to have an economically viable project or I'm new to the state or I've been here a long time and simply don't have uh, access. And we as a nonprofit organization really don't have the kinds of funds available to be able to support people in that. And my sense is that there's, there's much, much more demand than we have as a state available. I also wanna mention that we as NOFA are a member of the Farm to Plate Network. In a moment, I'm gonna to speak to how this bill in particular connects with the priorities generated by the Farm to Plate Network. Who These are some of the partners that Abby named. Um, just as we've been strengthened by working together as the Working Lands Coalition, we've been brought together by the Farm to Plate Network. And just last year, we completed a 10-year plan. That process was really robust. Abby was very involved as were many other community partners across the state. That that project generated a set of briefs to detail the work ahead of us as a state in our food and farming system. And several of the priorities identified through that process would be addressed in this program. I'm gonna talk about that in a moment. But as an agricultural organization with a commitment to social justice, we take seriously, like taking a hard look at the reality of land ownership and agriculture here. Agriculture and land ownership together have this braided legacy of genocide and forceful removal of indigenous people from their land and enslavement in large parts of this country to farm that land. This really, this legacy laid the foundation of our nation's agriculture and with it, the whole economy. I'm naming this legacy because we cannot undo these atrocities, but we can acknowledge them and help them have that truth inform our sense of how we might repair them. I think Vermont has an opportunity to begin to acknowledge and seek that repair as a state. Just this morning, I was reading in Digger, the Office of Racial Equities report that disparities for BIPOC Vermonters have only grown since the beginning of the pandemic. And we know that people of color own homes and land in Vermont at far lower rates than the white counterparts. This disparity contributes significantly to this well-documented generational wealth disparity between BIPOC and white people in the country at large and here in Vermont. Also, from the perspective of an agricultural organization, we're standing in the early stages of climate migration to Vermont. This process is causing land prices to skyrocket. It's causing farms to be sold for development and second and third homes to sell for really incredible amounts of money. This upward pressure is making land access for all farmers and Vermonters much more challenging, and particularly for BIPOC who already stood at a historically and currently disenfranchised and inequitable position. This trend 
I believe is going to continue. We need to take action so that all land doesn't become out of reach. A bill like this one could serve to interject as working lands has support to address and ameliorate these realities. And as an ag organization, we just see so much demand, as I mentioned, for land access and capital investment, particularly for BIPOC Vermonters and as it relates to our wheelhouse BIPOC farmers. Uh, you know, broadly, as an organic farming association, we want to speak to the value of biodiversity and diversity in human communities is the same. Vermont has this opportunity to serve as a leader, just as it has modeled investment in farm viability and protected its working landscape through the Working Lands Program. Vermont could secure, uh, could really model securing land ownership and housing for BIPOC and set this high bar, an example for the rest of the nation to, to look to. So I wanted to finally just call our attention back to the priorities that we as a state and a food system uh, network have identified in the state's 10 year strategic food plan that was completed by the farm to plate network. So priority strategy number two of that, because I think it bears repeating is to establish funding mechanisms like agricultural loan loss reserve, farm transfer financing to address food specific investment gaps, specifically for women and BIPOC owned businesses. Priority strategy three was to improve funding opportunities and create equitable access for BIPOC organizations and BIPOC owned businesses by developing multi-year unrestricted BIPOC centered grant and loan programs. Priority strategy 33 was to plan to plan, commit to and prioritize actions to begin eradicating structural racism in the food system. And goal 15, food system organizations and stakeholders prioritizing racial equity uh, and actions to eradicate structural racism uh, and to sort of center BIPOC leadership, which this bill has. So this bill has given us a chance to work on these priorities, which have been generated as a robust stakeholder process. And um, NOFA is, in, is just hoping that we can move forward on the work that we've identified as a community and believe that we have an opportunity to do so. So that's my testimony. I feel like my colleagues here today have spoken uh, more adeptly on the mechanics of the bill, but I'm happy to take any questions if you have them. Questions for Grace at this time? It really is a treat to have folks from the Department of Agriculture and from NOFA to come in here um, and, and, and really understand. I mean, the, I guess we're the general committee, right? So we just sort of, when we need to hear from everybody, we, we, we have that access and I really appreciate, I really appreciate your time to come in and I feel like there's more for us to ask, maybe not today, but to hear how interconnected the work on the work on the existing work on working lands, the existing work in land trust, the existing work across many different, I don't want to call them silos because we know where they are but that, that 273 is attempting to connect them in a slightly different way. Um, and so that's, that's, what we're, that's what we're trying to sort out here. This has been really um, illuminating for, for, uh, for me anyway, I'll speak for myself, but because um, I get in trouble when I speak for the committee. Um, <laughs> but the ideas here are, are very um, familiar. And I'm glad to see that a program that started back in, I remember when, two, when work, the concept came forward from, from uh, the first report, how far we've come since then. And to hear that it's really, Lynn Allen, to hear that it's really maturing into a program where the system itself is set up in a way that I think we need to pay attention to for this bill as well, the, the idea of committee work and, and how that works. So um, thank you. Um, Thank you for your time. Representative Triano, question before we take a quick break. Uh, just uh, concurring with your, uh, um, your, what you had just said, I mean, yeah, you made the connections uh, to the, to the uh, heart of this bill, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and I remember when NOFA was formed <laughs> many years ago. Uh, so I really appreciate you coming in, Grace, and uh, speaking that as you did, uh, and as I said, you really made the connection um, between what you folks are doing and what this bill is going to try and do. So thanks very much. Thanks for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And we're gonna take a five minute break and Stephanie, we will start with you at 10.15.